Hello, everyone. Um, so now I'm going to lecture on Tao Yunming's poem. Um, my today's lecture title is Tao Yunming's Utopia of Returning to Ziran and the Chinese Lyric Tradition. So the title of my lecture already is capture the three major um, questions. First, what was Tao Yunming's political ideal, and how did he express this ideal in his poetry? What kind of self-image did he craft through his writings? So let's start from the author himself. Who is Tao Yunming? So Tao Yunming was, an, uh, was considered as one of the greatest Chinese poets in the pre-modern time. He was born from a very illustrious family. Um, his great uh, grandfather Tao Khan held considerable power in the early Eastern Jin Dynasty. But by the time of Tao Yunming's was born, the family had fallen into poverty and decline. So in his early years, and Tao Yunming himself held various official positions, but because of the illu this illusion um, by the corruption. Tao Yuming decided to withdraw from the public life and uh, um, and sustain himself through farming. He decided to become a farmer. Um, so what's happened in Tao Yuming's time, right? So Tao Yuming's time was was considered as the Wei Jing period. So this period was considered as a transformative um, era in the Chinese history. Um, so, politically speaking, it was a time of the major disorder and, uh, and division. There were a lot of the conflicts and wars that really torn the society apart. But this period was also one of the most creative and iconoclastic period in the Chinese Empire history. So, so there's a great story from this time that really capture the periods focusing on the individualism. We see the rise of individualism in the Beijing period. So here I have a story. Um, so when the Huan Wen was young, he and Ying Hao were both highly regarded and they constantly fought a spirit of mutual rivalry. Huan once asked Ying, how do you compare with me? Ying replied, I've been keeping company with myself a long time. I'd rather just be me. So in this short episode, we find out the words I and me at least repeated um, five times. In other words, I just want to be myself. I don't need to care about what others think. We see here an unprecedented focus on individualism. So this cultural environment clearly influenced Tao Yuming. His poetry shows a strong sense of individualism, reflecting the Wei Jing period's spirit of staying true to oneself and not worry about societal expectations. So on Tao Yuming's where is Tao Yuming's hometown? Uh, his hometown is called the Tao Yachun, actually uh, in the Jiangxi province. So before the COVID about 10 years ago, I went to um, his hometown and visited Tao Yuming's um, the village. So here's a map of, of Jiangxi, right? Here's the, the city called Jiujiang. His, um, his um, hometown is not very far away from the, from the um, to from this um, city. So um, so this um, place nowadays actually it does not look very impressive at all um, because the village was um, was transformed into a construction set at the time when I visited. So the local government um, is, was applying to build a resort there. So there's not a lot of historical spot related to Tao Yuming um, either. But luckily, um, just a very short distance from the village, there's a really a beautiful stream up on hill. 
so at the corner of the hill, we also discovered a huge rock, um, which is called the Drunken Stone. The stone, um, as the story goes, Tao Yuanming once got so drunk, so he ended up sleeping right there on the rock because we know Tao Yuanming really liked um, drinking wines. So this uh, drinking stone becomes only um, things that related with uh, Tao Yuanming uh, nowadays in this village. So uh, Tao Yuanming's Political ideal were vividly represented in his short essay called Peach Blossom Spring. So the Peach and Blossom Spring tells the story of the fisherman who sails down a river lined with blooming peach trees. So at, at the end of the river, um, the fisherman finds a narrow um cave so he squeezing through the cave he discovered a hidden village filled with people and animals the villagers are surprised but very welcoming so they explain that their ancestors had escaped to this secluded place during the qin qin, qin dynasty and since then, they they had no contact with the outside world. As a result, they are completely unaware of any changes in the political landscape. They live happily and self-sufficiently. This story is not only famous in China, but also across East Asia. So much so that, um, that Peach Blossom Supreme became an idiom of Utopia in East Asia. In the Peach Blossom, uh, in the Peach and Blossom Supreme, Tao Yuanming represents his vision of an ideal society, a beautiful environment, and a peaceful life. In this utopian society, there is no kings, no war, no poverty, and no deception. People are simple, kind, and live in harmony, leading a self-sufficient, joyful, and prosperous lives. Everyone works, and society is basically unequal freedom and simplicity. Most importantly, this paradise exists beyond the constraint of historical time. It is an eternal heaven on earth. So where Tao Yuanming's um, imagination comes from? I think so. Can, so uh, Tao Yuanming's Peach and Blossom Spring draws on the two sources of the Chinese thought. First, it reflects the Taoist ideal of the simple society with a small country and few people. Second, it incorporates the Confucian concepts of the grand unity or the commonwealth where harmony and shared purpose prevails. So let's take a look of the, the grand unity in the Confucian tradition. In the Confucian tradition, right, we have the book is called um, Record of Ritual. In this chapter of rituals, the ritual we understand and also telling us how the grand unity, how this um, an ideal and society look like. We read, Master said, the practice of great way, the illustrious men of the three dynasties, those I shall never know in person, and yet they, they inspire my ambition. When the great way was practiced, the world was shared by all alike. The aged found the fitting close to the lives, the robust their proper employment. The young were provided with an upbringing and a widow and a widower, the orphaned and the sick with proper care. Therefore, 
all evil plotting was prevented and uh, thieves and rebels did not arise so that people could leave their after gates unbought. This was the age of the Datong or the Grand Unity. In Datong society, the government is led by virtuous people. Every individual is well cared of. And and each people's potential is fully realized. People in such a society would live peaceful lives. The ideal of the Datun is so appealing that it has inspired countless Chinese thinkers, politicians, and artists to reinterpret it or even dedicate themselves to realizing it in society. Tao Yuanming, of course, was one of those individuals. However, unlike the traditional ideal of seeking a wise king or the sage to rule the society, Tao Yuanming also envisioned a small community with government limited to a minimal rules, even advocating for a kind of non-governmental society. This vision was heavily influenced by another philosophical tradition that is Chinese Taoism. In the Chinese and Taoism, they have the concepts of the Xiao Guo Guaming, or life there be a small country with few people. So in the chapter 80 of the Dao De Jin, uh, we read this. Let there be a small country with few people, who even having much machinery does not use it, who take death seriously and don't wander far away. Even though they have boats and carriages, they never ride in them, having armor and weapons, they never go too far onto war. Let them return to merriment by hiding knots in rope, sweeten their food, give them their nice clothes, a peaceful abode, and a relaxed life. Even though the next country can be seen and its dogs and, and the chickens can be heard, the people will grow old and die without visiting each other's land. So in the Taoist tradition, they also advocating the so-called Pu, or the simple and plain life and star that is was considered as the original nature of a human being before it was tempered by the knowledge and restrained and restricted by the morality. So that was also considered as original state of human society. So in this, in the a Taoist on Xiao Guo Guaming, or the small country with few people, there is no books, there is no um, records. So the people of this area actually has no desires, and their mind was not polluted by the knowledge as well as the teaching of the moral lessons. So the human beings actually uh, were very simple and they attained to their true nature. But any intentional human intervention is seen as potentially disrupting the, the harmony of the nature transformation, of the natural transformation. The Taoist ideal society embodies the so-called spontaneous rhythm of the primitive agrarian the community living in an unconscious harmony with nature's cycles. So apparently, the Tao Yuanming's um, peach blossom spring was greatly influenced by these two um, Chinese philosophical teachings. Um, so another very interesting um, so defining feature of the Beijing period um, that is was uh, a very profound nostalgic feeling of the ancient times. So in the vision period, the people they believe actually the golden age was the, the primitive ages. So they demonstrate a uh, so-called the theory of the end of the civilization they have, which suggesting the human progress had led society towards a tragic decline. So 
In other words, in the Vizim period, the people has a very unique idea about the human beings' history that is, in the ancient time, that is much better than the contemporary ages. So in the Vizim period, um, the Chinese and philosopher, for example, the Ji Kang, reflect on this, um, on the human beings' history. And he have a deep sign and he noted that the former king were benevolent and compassionate. That means actually the current king actually are doing something country. They mourned the state of the world and worried about times. They grieved the, the decline of all things as virtue declined and great we thank. Similarly, thinkers believe that human morality was in steady decline. Ranji also observed um, the same thing. He also said, following the Confucianism and Maoism came the school of the uh, of Jianzheng and Bai Jia, who tried to tie themselves to ideas of good and evil. People grew obsessed with gains and losses, forming fractions on forming affections and allowing the arguments to undermine one another. So this sentiment not only reflects a profound disappointment with political system of the Han Dynasty before them, but also conveying a disillusionment with the swift rise and fall of the dynasties and the senses of regret over the failure of Confucian political ideals. Um, so it seems like, you know, in the Beijing period, actually the people that lost the trust of the Confucian teachings, actually this kind of idea was also shared by the modern the philosophers such as um, so Rousseau and uh, Levi and Strauss, right? Both of them actually argued the human history actually is also in declining. So when we're reading Tao Yuanming's poetry, actually, we notice that Tao Yuanming was also um, have a very similar idea about the human being's history. He also demonstrated a very strong nostalgic feeling of the ancient golden age. Fox Mampo wrote in this poem, encouraging agricultural read this. In the ancient times, the first people were born proud and self-sufficient, embracing simplicity and truth, while Shun plod and Yu also harvested. Okay, so this is very important. So in this poem, actually, he mentioned about two uh, legend legendary kings, Shun and Yu, right? Two of them actually are also working in the fields. They have the similar job with ordinary people. Apparently, Tao Yuanming actually made a kind of a counter-argumentation with Confucius, right? Because we know Confucius actually support the hierarchical order of society. So, so but Tao Yuanming actually think um, this kind of society actually is not the best one. We want to go back to even the ancient time where the social status actually are not, um, does not exist. Um, in this time, right, in this kind of ancient times, the human beings actually living harmoniously with each other. The human being actually in general freedom. They're not ruled by any people. Um, so actually even the kings actually are do the same thing. Um, so the people and the kings actually in join the world together. So there's no unclear, there's no um, class and distinctions and there's no um, uh, no differences between the king and the commerce and the people are all free and happy. So from the economic perspective, actually this ideal world actually is primarily agriculture. And more importantly, the ruler and the people actually shared the world together. The Tao Yuanming was evidently influenced by the idea of the golden age lost, right? So he repeatedly depicting the senses of the golden age, um, of, of the uh, golden age. And he depicted himself actually as people who want a uh, yearling to go back to those uh, golden ages. And so we have another example here. 
He said, you know, I'm home day in, day out, taking things easy. Herbs and flowers grow in rows, trees and bamboo gather shade. My cattle is turned clear, and half job think why wait, a one waits. But sadly, unable to reach that golden age, Huang and Tan ruled, I inhabited who I am, sad and alone, right? So in those poems, actually, we, we find out So on Tao Yuanming, actually he um shared a similar view with his contemporaries that an ancient time actually is much better than the contemporary age. The human being's history actually is towards a tragic and decline. He is always looking to go back to those uh, beyond and uh, those uh, begun uh, golden ages, and so. Sometimes he also uh, think himself as a person who um, who is living in the in the um, ancient times. So this kind of nostalgic feeling actually are so um, obvious, right? In the Tao Yuanming's poems, we have many other examples such as this one. How far away Hermes to a knee, a, a thousand years away, and where one mind. All I want is more of the same, much more. Working your own field is no cause of lament, right? That is uh, Tao Yuanming's imagination of the past, right? It's a kind of agrarian society that uh, everyone is working in the fields with no class and distinctions and all free and happy. Okay, so that means actually, um, Um, Tao Yuanming actually want to go back, right? So, uh, when we read in Tao Yuanming's poem, we find out you know the words, um, one of the key words, return, um, becomes so uh, become one of the of the central themes, um, in his poems. More precisely, he advocates returning to Ziran. Okay, so let me explain what does returning to Ziran mean. Okay, um, so first of all, returning to Ziran means returning to humanity's original states. Okay, so what does returning to the original state mean? Okay, so returning And going back in Tao Yuanming's poem, actually return to, um, re refers to return to the life of the fields and the uh, nature. So here, nature original means one's true self, and carries the implication of returning to the homeland where one's ancestors live, a return to the source. Of the life, uh, so this is very important. Okay, so uh, before we talk about uh, returning to the human, the human beings original of, of the states. So let's briefly on uh, discussing um, several interesting concepts in uh, in Tao Yuanming's point. That is the form, shadow, and spirits. So just now we talk about Tao Yuanming's poetry was greatly influenced by Confucian's teaching as well as the Taoist teaching. But, but to be honest, we also observe in so Tao Yuanming actually he is an independent thinker. He has ability to make the counter argumentation to make the dialogue with all those the dominant figures. So just now, as we mentioned, right, and he do not agree with Confucius' idea of the ideal society is hierarchical on society and the people are living in a hierarchical orders. And he want to live in a society is more equal and more free. In the meantime, he also does not agree with the Taoist teaching that human being is living in a very primitive age and with no senses of the of the shame. So in the poems of the shadow form and Sibaris actually he um, inherited those ancient teachings, but he also uh, built his own argumentations. Okay, so in the dialogue between the form, shadow, and Sibaris, the author present a different aspect of the self. So for the form, Is associated with 
a simple hedonistic tendency of the self. You know, that is using a hedonistic way of living to forget the worries. So those worries actually arise from awareness of the human body will inevitably decay with the passage of the time, right? Because you find out your life is too short, right? So the best way to live life is to enjoy the best thing. And the shadow, on the other hand, actually embodied the desire from rising from the humans, uh, uh, rising from the Confucian values, such as pursuit of the fame and the wealth. Apparently, Tao Yuanming here using the image of the shadow, um, which suggests his view on the fame of the fortune, which is not worthwhile to pursue. On the contrary, spirits of the Shen actually represent Tao Yuanming's highest spiritual states, that is, to seek the transcendental, both the inevitable decay of the body and desire for fame and the wealth. Spirits refers to the special state of mind, a mind of human life, which, in distinction, uh, which distinctions between nature, spirits, and form have not yet emerged. So the spirits actually for him is the highly state of mind that is human being do not have idea of the decay of the human body of a human beings and body, and the time when the human being do not have the desire to pursue the fame and the honor. So this is an ideal state of mind that resonant with the Taoist and teaching, but with some kind of human beings um, self-consciousness. So that is the first um, dimension of returning to Ziran. Okay, returning to Ziran actually is returning to the states where the human beings actually has no distinction of the class. The human being has no distinction of the um, of the desire to pursue the fame and wealth, and the time when the human beings actually um, do not have. Um, the desire to pursue um, the hedonistic way of living, the human being do not have knowledge of the death. Okay, so in the Tao Yuanming's poetry, actually, uh, we understand that the one of the major theme is talking about returning or uh, go, uh, going back. So in 402 AD, Tao Yuanming, he submitted his um, letter of resignation and decided to return, to go back. Where he returned, that is a very interesting thing, he decided to return to the so-called the place where his um, ancestors are living. So in his um, representative work, Back Home Again Chant, which you like it, so we found out the words return and back appeared at least three times. So this return actually not only in talking about to go to live in a you know, kind of the primitive way of living, but on the contrary, actually his return and back is going to the so-called back to the garden and the shoes. And he think actually return to our ranges of life actually is, is returning to become a farmer, to become, and for his understanding, that is our ranges of life. Apparently from here, you can see the distinction between Tao Yuanming and the Taoist teaching. Right? Taoist teaching said return to the primitive state of life, right? But Tao Yuanming say returning is returned to become farmers to have some kind of the civilizations. So he said, so now my land up on the source age cleared. I nurture simplicity among gardens and hues home again. Back again after so long in that trap, I've returned to all that comes of, of itself. That is returned to 
自然 right? So here the Zi Ran for Tao Yuanming after is returning to live in the ancient villages and to become a farmer. Okay, and return to Zi Ran also mean, re, means return to the one's true self and carries an implication of returning to the homeland where one's ancestor once lived. And he think that is the source of life. Um, so we read the poems, right? So actually, um, another meaning of returning that is also um, re re related with a very interesting Chinese idea um, of returning to, um, to where you come from. So in the Chinese of philosophy, life is also seen as the gathering and the dispersing of the qi. The qi can be translated into the vital energies. So returning um, also means, um, does not in, so in the Chinese tradition, returning does not mean going to heaven, but returning to the land associated with the oranges of life. So this is why uh, when we're reading the poem together, we all go out under the separate trees in the Zhou family and burial and ground. The poet find the joy in being with the soul under the separate trees, right? So graveyard is where human being actually returns to. Okay, before um, so besides of the idea of return back to the ancestors' land, in Tao Yuanming's poems, actually, we also see a very interesting image about the re related with returning, that is the returning birds. Okay, so in the Chinese poetry, um, the birds in flight also often symbolize a spirit that has um, broken free from the co constraints of pursued lofty ideals. But in Tao Yuanming's poetry, um, he has a particular fondness for depicting the birds returning home at dark. Simply because at the sunset, it is a time when life seeks rest and peace. Birds too also needs to find a place to, to rest in a suitable uh, so place. In the same way, the life that has drift also needs a place to settle. But so it seems like you know, the author using the returning birds right, to symbolize his internal desire right, to find a place, a suitable place to rest. But we can also interpret the returning words in a different manner, such as in this um, point, reading the classic of mountains and the seas number one, we read the returning words. In the early summer, everything's lush. Our house sat deep up among broad trees. Birds delight in taking refuge here. I too love this little place. And now I plowing and planting are finished. I can return to my books again and read. So in this point, right, the returning birds to our, to us, to our surprise also share the same word as the poet, right? So poets and, and the birds actually share the same space. In the summer woods, the birds find a place to, to dwell and sing joyfully. The poet, too, also built a such heart in, he, um, in the land where his ancestor once lived. So this coexistence between the birds and the poet suggests a connection between the poet's life and the life of the animals and life of the cosmos. The poet's life merges with the rhythm of the temple of the changing universe, which creates a sense of beauty that arises from accepting life's transformation with joy. This also embodies the beauty of finding peace and happiness in 
these ancient villages. As life arises through riding the transformation of the nature, so it seems like the nature and uh, the individual's life actually were seamlessly unconnected. There's no clear distinctions, right? So that means returning to Ziran also means living in harmony with nature. Okay, so I give you one, so another example. So in Taoyuan Ming's representative poetry, Home Again Among Garden and Hues, we read the author vividly dis depicting his life when he returned to the garden and fields. We read this. Okay. I've got nearly two acres here and four or five rooms in my thatched hut. Arms and willow shade the eaves out the back, and in front, peach and plum spread wide. Distant village people lost in distant haze, kitchen smoke hangs above the wide open country. Here dogs bark deep in, in the back rows, and roasters crawl from mulberry trees. No confusion within the gate, no dust. My empty home harbors adios to spare. So in these, you know, ancient villages, the author actually find a simple happiness and peace. That is where he feel com comfortable ways, is a place where he find the happiness. So, so, so in the number two, we find that actually the author's life actually was um, he carefully describing how his life really looked like. He said, and day after day, coming and going on over a ground path, I meet neighbors without confusion. We only talk about how the crops are doing nothing more. In the number three, we found out the author said, I get up early to clear ways and shouldering my hole, returning the moonlights. And in the number four, right, we read, on years never wandering mountains and lake gone, elated again and foreigns and fields. I take children by the hand and set off to the woods and abandon farmland, etc., etc. So in the garden, in the home, again, among garden fields, we identify a very interesting um, archetypes um, in his poem that is the seasonal, the, the seasonal um, archetypes. So the author describing the sense of claiming the land in the spring and waiting beans in the summer and harvesting in the autumn. So those things actually suggesting returning to the countryside and to become a farmer. This farmer's life is also a return to the natural's order of life. It seems like your life actually began to follow the cycle of the four seasons. So beyond the, of this, and so describing of the changing of the four seasons, and the, and the, uh, we also see another cycles in this group of poems as well. So that is, this theory actually begins from the, um, the description of the surrounding of the simple home, a thatched house and a village, and then shift to the poetry of the fields and mountains, and finally return to the home and the village. And through this reading, we also see another cycle of the time, that is the pattern of working at sunrise and resting and sun, sunset. This reflects a harmonious coexistence with the natural rhythm of the daily life. We read the number three. I get up early to clear weed and shouldering my hole return by moonlight. The path narrow, the brush and the trees thick, evening dew, um, so pierces my and closes, but there's not too wet, just damp enough. It reminds me never to resist. 
So this description of the cycles of nature, the cycle of the seasons, actually remind us um, the modern landscape study uh, of the agriculture landscapes. So in the modern landscape and study, they think, you know, the agriculture or the traditional agriculture is sustainable because it's always recycled and repeated right endlessly. So this suggested a kind of the sustainable development of a traditional agriculture that reflects the value of life that is important factor in the beauty of agriculture landscape because the agriculture landscape actually is sustainable and so it seems like Tao Yuming is very good at describing this sustainable uh, model of tra traditional agriculture in his poetry. So returning to Ziran also means also we see another dimension of returning to Ziran. Returning to Ziran also means the human beings activity actually blend seamlessly with the surrounding of the landscapes. So here we have one example is one very famous poems written by Tao Yuming that is wandering at Xie Creek on Yu Xie Chuan. So in these poems Tao Yuming describing the sceneries as follow. Air fresh and sky clear. I sit with friends beside the stream flowing far away. Here a stripped beam with the gentle current and calling gas rise over the lazy valley, eyes wandering distant waters streaming, I make out Zen Hills. It's meager compared to Quinlun's majestic peaks, but nothing inside rivals it. So the most uh, beautiful scenes in these poems is during the beautiful season where the poet and his friends sit by the water, by the stream. In their relaxed posture blend seamlessly with the surrounding landscape of mountains and rivers. And before them lies a distant view, the Zen Hills, right? The Zen Chen. Uh, so it seems like the human beings and gesture actually also blend seamlessly and harmoniously with the surrounding landscape, mountains, and rivers. And human beings are simply enjoying those beautiful sceneries in nature. So in the Tao Yuming's poetry, actually, he also very good at um, so depicting the wind, the fen. Uh, this is very interesting images in Tao Yuming's poetry. Tao Yuming actually is very skilled at writing about the wind, capture the moment of unexpected encounter with nature and uh, sensing the harmony between the poetry and earth rhythm. So we read the poetry like this um, in the returning seasons we read, feeling the south wind, your young the grain ripples like wind. Distance wind sweeping in cross fields, delicate seedling also wander at this fresh life. Bird sings celebrating the new season, Cool winds bring up blessings in abundance. So it is as at the wind itself, so creating the poetry. The wind is a breath of the earth and sky. When Tao Yuming works in the fields, it seems as though he's using his entire life, his entire body to feel the earth breathe. This sense of intimate connection with nature is deliberate aspect of Tao Yuming's poetry and evoke enchanting feelings. So return to Ziran also means to rediscovering the ability to sense nature's rhythm and its subtle changes. So I think only those who personally work in the fields or standing in the fields can describe vividly 
the refreshing sensation of the southern breeze. The poet has fully immersed himself in the rhythm of the nature, with the southern breeze described as nature's music. Through his labor in the fields, Tao Yuanming feels an a genuine joy. He connects his emotions with those of ancient people, right? That is the simple happiness he enjoyed in the fields when he worked in the fields. But how you mean? Actually, he also realized. Uh, so the simple happiness is actually described in the ancient times actually are not easily to be realized. So he think actually this kind of simple happiness actually can be realized only in a certain moment, um, only in a certain moment. Uh, at the time when the body and the nature harmoniously exist, coexisted. Okay, so we see an example of describing this kind of the sudden enlightenment, right? You know, of 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 the happiness in the simple life. So in the number three of returning to the garden of fields, we read the following descriptions. So the author, the poet, on picking chrysanthemums at my east fence. Far off, I see the southern mountain, mountain air lovely at dusk, birds in a flight returning home. All this means something, something absolute. Whenever I start to explain it, I've forgotten the words. So this description actually remind us, you know, the simple happiness we saw in the peach blossom spring. So it seems like even uh, at a certain moment, right, when you remember those golden ages, right, so your existence actually was transported back into the history. You remember those harmonious coexistence between the harmony so between the nature and the humanities. So the mind, as he mentioned here, wherever the mind draws apart, it is self a distant. On place, right? So your mind was transported into the ancient times, and you feel actually the same happiness the people experienced in the peach blossom spring. So, on um, Tao Yuming actually is very good at, and um, is very good at describing those simple and a peaceful state of mind. Uh, and he think this kind of simple and peaceful um, happiness can, all, can only be found in an honest and hard work in the fields. So besides of that, so, so, so Tao Yiming also very good at um, writing um, the simple happiness um, in uh, in the on daily lives, uh, in the on daily lives, and he think actually so the simple happiness actually can be realized not in any other places, but in an ordinary and unadorned so place, and this place actually that is the garden hues. This place actually do not have any mystical elements at all. So the garden and the fields, that is the place where we saw in the peach blossom spring, which represent Tao Yuming's nostalgic reflection of the ancient period where all people are equal and have a simple life and star. And he and they this kind of memories actually serves um, so, so Tao means imagination of the ideal world, that is, human being exist harmoniously, coexist with nature. Okay, so you can 
understand this in a certain moment when you're working in the fields. Um, although he realized this kind of golden age cannot go back in reality. Okay, so let's talk about uh, so Tao Yunming's um, um, so depiction uh, of himself, right? You know, working in the garden in the fields, uh, in the uh, in the uh, garden in the fields. So I suggest actually we can interpret or read the peach and blossom spring as a a parable. That is a person in a remote corner of the world discovered the cave. He entered the cave and found himself, you know, in a secluded paradise. But after leaving the cave, other himself, nor anyone else, can ever re-enter this place. So as we mentioned to just now, right, you can only at a certain moment, right, you can re-experience those kind of simple happiness, but you cannot forever live in there. So in this case, right, you know, we might view the Tao Yunmin's poetry as his way of embodying the role of the person from the peach blossom supreme. Although the entrance to the utopia now is closed, the poet, through his labor in the fields, can unexpectedly experience the life of the peach blossom supreme. So we observe in Tao Yunming's poetry, it remarked by a strong autobiography traits. This is evident in his work like The Allergy for Myself, the burial sound, and uh, the biography of Mr. Five Willows. All those poetry actually can be read as um, his biographical, autobiographical writings. In addition, in reading the biography of ancient figures, right, he also wrote a lot of poems about ancient uh, farmers. He also using those farmers to reflect his own image uh, through the imagination of the ancient farmers. So the image, so the self-image of the poet of Tao Yunmin's poetry actually was also greatly influenced by the image of all those ancient farmers who are living in poverty. So we find out one of the interesting aspects of Tao Yunmin's uh, self-image in the poem actually that is um, is the humble and the impoverished farmers. Actually, he does not shy away from describing his humble and impoverished side in his poems. Um, we read the poems like this, right? So, and the day after day, coming and going on growing paths and meet neighbors without confusion. We only talk about how the crops are doing nothing more, right? You know, some of very daily routine, unattractive, you know, daily experiences, he writes that into the poems. And he also describing some of very embarrassing moments, such as bagging food, right? Hey, hunger came and dropped me up. No idea where I'd end up. I went on and on, coming to the village, knocked the door of my neighbors, right? He bagging food. He also describing those um, embarrassing moments. So the interesting of those poems actually is not only about the poverty, but the author, the poet actually, he tried to bring a kind of poetic beauty, right, you know, um, to his um, daily and simple life, right, in the ancient um, villages. So he not only describing um, his, you know, poverty and his uh, humble life, but he also is, is, um, is very skillfully in capture the simple joy. He's not only talking about sufferance, he also talk about the simple joy within the humble life, such as the, the point we read from uh, after Guo, um, Guo Zhu Bu's poems. We read, 
I grant Millard make up a lovely wine. Our son play beside me, too young to speak. He keeps, um, he keeps trying new songs. All this bring back such joy I forgot and glittering, uh, so careers right. And he is very good and capture those happy moment right within a humble life. Um. So besides of those uh, description of his um, sufferings and his his humble, um, simple life, right? We also observe another side of Tao Ming's life, that is the refined and elegant side of his poetry. So in those poetries, actually, we can see the self image actually is um, is enjoying the carefree life and uh, seems very elegant. So such as in the poem we read, my cattle is tuned clear and half jar of thick one weeds. Picking chrysanthemums at my east fence, far off, I see southern mountain, mountain air lovely at dusk, birds in flight returning home. So we see the poets actually have a carefree life in drinking the wines. In play the instrument, in appreciating the chrysanthemums, and have the um the landscape, the mountain viewing. So this is the Tao Yuming who has come to embody the ideal of cultivated scholar in the minds of the later Chinese literati. So Tao Yuming's self image is one of the self respect and also contented. But those things also arising from an ordinary lives. Okay, so that means you know he um adding an poetic beauty to his ordinary um lives in his poetry. Um, so we make a very quick summary of what we um discussed um just now. So Tao Yu means poetry creates a vision of life. That embodies a return to the ancestral land, to the source of life itself. That is what he called return to Ziran, or return to the origins of life. So here, the Ziran, and for him, return to the simple agrarian life, and the continuity of family in a traditional village, and follow the cycle of the seasons and the rhythm. Of the sunrise and sunset, right to live naturally, to follow the rhythm of the nature, and to 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 develop a very strong senses of the subtle changes of the nature, and all those things he believe are the natural way of living. So Tao Yuming's poetry actually portrays the life of the poet who has returned to. To the so-called authentic state of life, or the oranges state of life, his simple lifestyle is filled with poetic beauty, and it is not only sufficient; it's not only self-sufficient, but also attuned to the rhythm of the customers and the subtle changes in nature. In this life, human dwell poetically and harmoniously upon the earth. And in doing so, Tao Yuming resolves the crisis of his existence. From now on, he can poetically and peacefully live in this land. Okay, so that's all of my lecture.